Okay, yeah, all good, sorry. Subscription-based models for software both increases access and safety for users as well as creating a more competitive marketplace. A few points of setup. Firstly, what is the difference between subscription and outright? The way that a subscription works is that usually the product is owned by some kind of web-connected server like Netflix, for example, or some kind of application you use, for example, on your Fitbit, you might connect to a certain application that tracks your heart rate, and that's associated with some kind of account that you log in to use it, right? So uh, your Microsoft Word account, your Office account is associated with some kind of account and they check every month if you've subscribed and you pay that subscription they use that to determine your access the difference between that and outright ownership is to have legal outright ownership that stuff can't exist on like a web server that you access that has to be a file that you actually own right that you can have on your computer that you can copy and distribute so given those are the kind of key distinctions and they seem to reasonably agree let's talk about some examples so uh, the first set of software that's like online shit like Photoshop uh, Office I manage zero me a lot of stuff used by personal still uses but also large company workplace usage and obviously there's the second type which is the ones connected to physical devices so that's things like uh it's a small but growing area gps's and smart devices where you have like the literal like smart device but you can't use it unless you subscribe to something like google home for example i would say under the status quo both of these exist to some degree how the market is overwhelmingly trending towards our model of subscription for the simple reason that everyone in the market consumers and suppliers know that this is a more intelligent and a better model and their side is idiotic so two points in this debate firstly why this is better for users that is individuals and small businesses secondly why it's better for the market companies and developers so firstly in terms of users we think access is overwhelmingly better on our side for a simple simple reason the price if you're a company and you develop a software right if you can have people uh, subscribe then they can pay a small amount of money over a long amount of time However, if you have people buy one off to own it, they have to pay a large amount of money at once in order to make the same amount of profit. That means that under their side, people have to pay a large upfront cost in order to buy that software and own it outright. And that is extremely, extremely problematic because there's loads of people that just don't have the money to buy that outright. There's loads of small businesses that want to start up and want to try that software initially, but don't have the capital or don't have the solvency in order to, you know, buy a massive amount of like software at once, but instead want to, you know, pay a while they own that money so that will borrow some money so in the future they can keep using it. There's also lots of businesses that only want to use it temporarily. Like you might be a company that like, like sells meat and you want to run a marketing campaign and during that month you might uh, you know pay $30 for a graphic design software to use for that month but you don't want to use it for the rest of your life under their world they just like never do that marketing campaign because they would have to pay you know like $500 for that software and that would be too expensive for their bottom line so we think generally access to software massively improves on our side the second thing to note is in terms of patching uh, so patching is what happens when you have a software that's like connected to the internet like League of Legends for example and they're like, oh, you know, like this champion's not balanced or there's this bug. And then they do a fix that, can, that, that, that passes over to that software that you continue to use. Now, under their side, there's no incentive to, for a company to patch at all for the simple reason that once you've made the one-off purchase, they do not make extra money from you as a consumer if they patch and improve your software. This is in contrast to our side where you're a continuing subscriber that holds them accountable. You can stop your subscription at any time. And that means they have a really strong incentive to patch. And those patches are just super, super useful, right? It looks like extra features that just improves the quality of life for consumers. It also looks like cyber security patches, which are crucially important in this debate because people generally are unaware to the blind spots in their software and this is extremely pertinent to things like data links to things like ransomware to things like even just like getting sensitive information like your text like your mobile phone number so they can send you uh, salacious text messages and the easiest way for a hacker to get access is not to like be some genius that like hacks the pentagon right like they just exploit existing public vulnerabilities in old software that people don't really know or care about and that means millions of people that don't use literally 2023 office whether it's 2007 office well it's old versions of like workplace software those people are all vulnerable to data leaks and are all being like likely to be held ransom this looks like big law firms that use old versions of filing software like hws well, that end up getting hacked this looks like you know like like israel right literally to develop a technology called pegasus that could hack every apple iphone on the on the planet and then apple was able to patch that out in the newest ios version but if you still have an iphone
iPhone 4 and you never like updated the software, you're just completely vulnerable to that. Like they can literally just open your phone. And this also looks like, you know, those like gaming accounts that didn't have, that had like the old encryption software and they upgrade that. But if you don't upgrade that, then you obviously get screwed, right? So that patching is really, really, really important for people. And it also means that it's useful for people who want to keep using old versions of software and don't want to update, upgrade to the new one. We can keep keeping them on date and modern and secure. Lastly, uh, just in case they're like, well, what if there's this old guy that just wants to use 2007 Word, doesn't want to keep subscribing, doesn't need all the fancy new features of 2023 Word. We'd say they cannot claim that stakeholder for the simple reason that Office themselves and Microsoft themselves doesn't, doesn't make any more money from this 2007 guy and they have an active profit incentive to push this guy towards the 2023 version. So what they do is they use methods of planned obsolescence where they intentionally hijack the software so that it becomes out of date or incompatible with new hardware over time. They do things like artificially like shorten the battery life of these physical devices so that people get locked out of that. So they literally benefit no stakeholders, even the ones who want to keep using old obsolete software. Lastly, I want to talk about why this is better for the market, that is companies and developers. So two passes. Firstly, in terms of profit incentive. The problem with uh, the, the, their side is that there's a very low profit incentive for companies to uh, make this kind of software. And we see this in a similarly tangentially related industry, which is music, right? Like there wasn't as much incentive for artists to make music because people, they weren't making money off it. And the reason why they weren't, weren't making money, money off it is because of pirating, right? Pirating happens exponentially more on their side than our side. The reason for that is because in order to own a software outright, you need to get a file that is offline that you can use whenever you want. That makes it easy to copy and distribute to other people but also it means if people have an illegal version of it there's no way for that company to actually crack down and stop your access because you own that file versus if you have like a Netflix account right you can't like distribute that Netflix account in the same way or you can't distribute that online software in the same way because there's a subscription model where people have to log in and you, if you don't have an account that is actively subscribed to that product they can lock you out of that product so pirating is way easier on their side than our side and when people pirate it means people like these software developers aren't making money from all the software and it means that there's just less incentive to develop it. The second thing to talk about is competition. We increase competition in a number of ways. Firstly, we allow people to switch to better products easily because if you're a big company and you buy, say, the 2015 version of Photoshop for your entire company, right? Like, and you spent millions of dollars so that the hundreds of thousands of employees in Google, for example, can use Photoshop. And then now like a slightly better version of Photoshop from a different competitor appears. You have no incentive to switch to that slightly newer version because you've paid millions of dollars for that software. So it's not worth the benefit of paying another few millions of dollars to buy the new software. Instead, if you're subscribing every month, every single month, you have a new opportunity to change to a competitor who is better. So we foster a more dynamic market. Secondly, it's also about risk, right? There's obviously in the tech space, there's a lot of startups, a lot of people new innovative ideas. But the problem is people don't want to try that new like product because they're not sure about it. They'd rather stick with the big brands that are reliable if they're going to fork out millions of dollars at once. We encourage people to take that risk because people see, well, I can try it and if it doesn't work, I can cancel in a month or two anyway. And lastly, the problem is that they have a high startup cost because the product has to be perfect at the start. Three benefits. Firstly, it's easy to regulate when there's more players. Secondly, there's more incentive to patch to keep up the competition and competition also leads to lower price and better features for consumers. Is very proud to propose. Awesome, thank you so much for that speech, and I'd like to welcome the first next speaker. Internet-enabled hardware is specifically mentioned in Emotion, and I'd like to point out that my laptop is internet-enabled, and I think having to rent it would be pretty fucking shit, but being charitable from here. Three things in a speech. Firstly, about how this is less costly to individuals, then about how this increases the quality of products overall, and finally, responses if I'm bothered. 
Firstly, in terms of whether or not this is less costly for users. The main thing here is gonna be talking about individuals and then about companies. Firstly, on individuals. The first thing to note is there are huge amounts of biases that affect individuals when they're going to purchases and when they're spending money. Three main ways these biases occur. The first one is to say that they often don't account like they have a short-term bias towards the kind of money that they have in the short term, so they're more likely to be like see a like small a small fee and be more okay with that. Secondly, though, they don't account for the long term of this aspect. They are unable to like incrementally add up the fact that they are spending a lot of money over time. So even if it might be a sixty dollars subscription now, they are unable to cognitively add up the fact that after twenty years they've spent a thousand dollars on the service. So that, so that means they are bad at accounting for the actual cost of the subscription and accounting for how much it will actually cost them on total when they use the service indefinitely. Overall, what this means then is that consumers are just bad at making this sustained choice about, choose, uh, about these services. Necessarily, this is completely different to when you were making a one-time purchase. Note here, when you make a one-time purchase, as there is probably a higher initial cost, you're more likely to question and think about and interrogate whether or not you need the service and the kind of money that is used for that service. You're more able to compare between different services because you are looking at one price as opposed to trying to compare the monthly subscription of this one to the yearly subscription of this one and having to do that sort of stuff yourself. Furthermore, though, to the nature of a subscription and the nature of how that transaction works, you're more likely to be, uh, you're more likely to be caught in like traps that the company will engage in. This is the company exploiting these biases by doing things like free trials and getting you to buy the service and then you sort of forget that that money is leaving your account month after month. But furthermore, because of the way that like money works on the internet now, when the money is leaving your account, you're not actually making that purchase yourself. On our side, when you are paying $200 for the service, you see the number 200 and you see it leave your account. As opposed to this on the other side, you see $60, you say in your head, that isn't a significant amount. And then the next month, you're not there, you're not actively checking up and you're not actively seeing that this subscription is happening. But finally, through the way that everything is moving towards subscriptions, you're somewhat like hard to keep track of every subscription that you're on, particularly when they do have different things, when one is monthly and one is yearly and one is quarterly. All of that is very hard to keep track of. So at some point, you are likely to maybe forget that you are actually on a subscription, which overall increases the cost for a product that you aren't even using at that point at all. That explains why overall the cost to individuals is much higher because they are bad at understanding how money works when it is a subscription and they're significantly better at understanding how a one-time purchase works because that's what people are used to. So then that explains why individuals have, are spending far less money on our side and why it is far less costly for them. Secondly then on companies, three things. Firstly, I'd just like you to do the math. Often companies rely, rely on these softwares for their entire existence. Like if you are an engineering company, you must pay for the SolidWorks subscription for your entire life as an engi engineering company because you're going to need to do CAD indefinitely. This means then I just want you to do the math between doing $60 forever and doing whatever they want because unless their price is like infinity, it's probably not going to be the same. The reality is it's probably going to be like, like maybe like $500. That's probably okay. Like it's a company, they can deal with it. Second thing then, I'd also note they would probably have tiers to this as in like lots of these subscriptions, so, uh, lots of these services when you pay for them, have a different thing if you're a student, if you're an individual, if you're a company using it for corporate purposes. All of those mean that it's likely we have a scale for individuals because that increases the amount of people this company can sell to and it increases then their total profit. Mm -hmm. Secondly though, you're allowed to use it as a tax, tax write-off now because you can only tax, uh, write off the tax on something if it is an asset that you own, so you cannot do that on the purchase that you make towards a subscription. Thirdly then, it is to say that it is a predictable cost, but subscriptions can fluctuate in how much they will cost over time, so you're far better able to do financial managing overall when it is a one-time fee you're accounting for and not something into the long term. This also then notably accounts for small businesses and Individuals, as I said before, this explains then why companies are paying far less when they are uh, when they're buying something outright as opposed to buying out uh, buying the subscription into the long term. So that, and that, that obviously I think is like clearly important because obviously if companies have more money, they can do other things, they pay more tax, whatever. Secondly, then in terms of the quality of the product and the software, firstly on innovation, the, rea the way that this works is to say that because the only way they can make more money is to produce a better product. Because in their side, the way they're making money is just by sitting on the, like just, just like sitting and watching people pay for their subscription month after month. On our side, because people bought it outright, the only way they can make money off that user again is to produce a substantially better product such that user decides that they ought to buy that again. They have the current Photoshop and Adobe has to prove that the newest Photoshop is so much better that you ought to pay for it again. This explains why innovation is far more likely to happen and that innovation is not likely to be service level because people have to just 
I mean, people are now justifying buying it again. That explains why you overall get better products into the long term. Secondly, though, it is just convenient. Often when it is a subscription, to check that you have paid that subscription, you have to have continued Wi-Fi access. That's probably just a bit shit when you exist in places that don't have significant Wi-Fi access. On our side, when you buy the product outright, you're more likely to be able to use it offline. You're more likely, because, um, more likely to be able to use it offline. That's just a good thing. That's good for the user. Thirdly, though, it is now a more customizable experience because you actually own the software itself and are able to adapt it yourself. This looks like, firstly, just like individually, I think this is good being able to do like plugins for Adobe. It's something that is quite useful. Secondly, you save money because you're now more likely to repair something yourself as opposed to having to pay for someone else to repair it because now it is something you own and they can't say that you have violated the subscription and the trademark by adapting it. Thirdly, though, oh, this is just like, again, why innovation itself must be significant because minor and aesthetic changes is something that you as an individual are, able to, are now able to do to the product as opposed to on their side where you must, um, where you are unable to do that and in, uh, so this means that the innovation has to be actual beyond the surface level because surface level ones can likely be done by the individual. The final thing in terms of quality is just to say that data mining can occur on their side at the point where you're forced to be connected to the internet and you're forced to exist on their servers. It's far more capable for them to actually engage in data mining and look at the data that you're handing over to them. It's far more likely you're going to get data leaks like they described when you have to put all of your things on a server. It's on our side at the point where you own the software that Microsoft has to say, could you please give us access to your direct desktop, which is something that they are unable to do and unlikely to do, which explains why the overall quality and user experience is far better on our side. So then now on responses. Firstly, they talk about how you can do patching now all of a sudden. First thing to say here is that obviously they could sell it as an add-on, they could sell a patch, and that would be something that people would be likely to buy, that's a way they could make money. They could say, there was this flaw in what we gave you, we've produced this thing that will improve it, you can buy it from us, and people are likely to buy it, which explains why the stuff about that is incorrect. But furthermore, um, Furthermore, in terms of the way that they talk about fixing security, I'd like to point out, as I said before, having your stuff exist on a server probably makes it less secure as opposed to having it on your own device. When a company is able to store all of those things within their domestic network and don't have to exist on an external server, that means it has higher security. Finally, they talk about planned obsolescence and whether or not you can use, like, so you can't use old software. But obviously, A, this is often being made illegal across various uh, various countries. Things like the EU are banning things like planned obsolescence. But the other thing to note is they said that you, like, this plan of lesson. This looks like planting a bug that in seven years will like destroy the code all of a sudden, so Microsoft Word won't work. I think that's just a bit silly and unlikely to be able to actually happen because someone is going to look through that code and say Microsoft planted a bug that makes Microsoft Office not work. Just in the same way that things came out about Apple changing the way the battery life worked in their phones, which meant that they got fucked in the legal system because they were doing something that is deeply legal. That explains then why that is likely to occur. Now, finally, in terms of competition. This is just a bit silly because A, it's often a monopoly. Like Photoshop is the only thing like Photoshop that works. The large majority of companies that need to do photo editing use Photoshop and use the Adobe suite. Furthermore, in terms of things like engineering, things like CAD, SolidWorks is used by literally every engineering firm worth their soul. The reality is that these are often monopolies in these software businesses because it does cost an enormous amount of money to build these softwares and there is an enormous amount of path dependency in these sort of things. Like when you have been using the same software for your entire life and you've been using it for 30 years, you're unlikely to be actually meaningfully able to change to a different software that has different tools, that has a different UI, that has a different way that you engage with it. I experienced it myself after seven years of using Fusion and moving to SolidWorks. It was a bit fucking shit. Imagine doing that after 30. Those reasons, proud to get. Awesome, thank you so much for that speech. And I'd like to welcome the second affirmative speaker. Ready to go? Firstly, I want 
access and cost, secondly on innovation and quality. On access, they bring uh, three claims, I would say. The first is on individuals, uh, and generally they make this, I think, quite strange claim, which is just that people are bad at managing subscriptions, they're dumb and can't do addition. I just don't think this is true. I think people are able to financially manage their situations in a range of instances, and actually I think it gets significantly better on their subscription system. And that's because I don't think it's just that you uh, like sign up for free and then yeah, maybe you get charged for one month unknowingly, but you are reminded month to month to reconsider whether this is something that you do need. Instead, when you're making a one-off purchase, all it takes is a moment of, oh, we really need, you know, like a, a meeting where everyone's like, oh, what if we got this really cool software and no one's willing to say no or that it's financially bad? And then you hive mind and buy that. Or as an individual, you just get a, you know, large paycheck or you get a pay raise and you're willing to buy it and you do not actually need it. I think that's significantly worse when it's a larger amount of money, it's lump sum rather than a month to month recommitment and reconsideration about whether or not that is a financial situation you're in. So I guess in summary, firstly, I do just think people can financially manage and budget. They do it in all capacities of their life. But secondly, I think that it's actually easier on the outside. Additionally, when you consider that as these guys acknowledge, this is becoming an increasing norm, people are learning to manage things like Netflix subscriptions and a range of subscriptions. And this is something that people are learning to respond to, whether that's through their own budgeting systems, whether that's through, you know, whatever metric they have. But again, I don't think it's like you're likely to get trapped by sneaky techniques. We know this system now. Everyone is subscribed to Netflix and various other things. I don't think that you are likely to be trapped in the way that they say you will. But again, I still just think this is at some level a bit of a minor cost. Maybe again, you pay one level of subscription, compare that to paying a large amount and then the product you're buying becoming obsolete or whatever. Again, I think our impacts there are just higher. The next thing they say is on companies. And here they basically, I think, make the assertion that when you need something forever, it will cost infinity into the future because you know, I, I, like, I guess it just will. But I just don't know that, that or think that that is necessarily true. I think that companies that are selling this software are going to you know, make a decision when they're selling it lump sum about how much they think the average user is going to use it for and you know like what the cost you know relatively would be i think they're potentially likely to be somewhat comparable because the business still has to cover the same costs on their ground and pay their employees the same amount so i think it's likely to evaluate to a similar uh, amount uh, but again i'll explain later why i think that we explain and i think david explains very clearly that actually it does get cheaper and particularly cheaper for particularly important uh Stakeholders, they then say that you can't use it as a tax write-off. I just think that's untrue. You can write off things that are subscription-based that you, you know, pay. You can even write off, right, like doing your washing or whatever, which is like, I guess, a one-off cost that you don't really own. You can you can put services on your tax write-offs as a company. I don't think that's true. The final thing, again, is they just make the assumption that you can't manage these subscriptions. Again, we're talking about companies that often do have, you know, at least treasurers and financial, like accountants and whatever else. They're going to be able to manage it. I think that is a little bit of a silly concern or affects an incredibly, incredibly small number of very silly you know people and individuals who are probably financially screwed anyway in our modern world so what do we say on price and why do we think it gets better the first thing is i just think all of our stuff on competition explains why you are likely to get lower prices i'll rework some of this later because obviously it also applies to quality but this is what david tells you about how when you are able to transfer from product to product when you're less risk adverse and less likely to go with the dominant market force because you want something forever and you want something permanent when you are more likely to take risks and smaller starting up companies because all you need to do is try it for a month and if you don't like you could even subscribe to two things at the same time if you you know are feeling like it at the moment it just does get better in terms of competition companies do need to you know have a price that is competitive in the like subscription field they can't just infinitely increase their prices as they potentially are more likely to when people are willing to pay far more because they view it as a lifetime commitment overall so i do just think honestly prices may just be lower in our world but again i think this is somewhat unknowable in the debate but i think we provide some very clear that this is likely to be a lower amount in the short term and that is important to two important groups firstly that is important to companies that just do not have the liquidity or capital to fork out a significant amount on buying one of these overall but do have the monthly income to be able to continually subscribe under their world they are just unable to access these sort of products whether that is things like word or graphic design software or a laptop i guess or whatever you're talking about they are just unable to buy that on face value but under our world, they do have access to that software again i think that's very certain and again probably quite a significant group because they are smaller businesses, ones that do provide important services and important employment to individuals, as well as important competition in markets. But secondly, we tell you about people who just need these things short term, which I think is a lot of people. For example, maybe you're a student and you need access to a specific software for an assignment. Maybe you are a company, as David suggests, who is doing a graphic design campaign or needs to design your logo at the beginning of your business. It's stupid to pay even $500 to own something long term that you're not going to have the need. These people, again, just get far better access on the outside, which I think is a big benefit and, again, a much more certain one than this. Will it 
accumulate overall to infinite money or less money than it would if you bought multiple things one off books you had to kind of move on overall but finally just on terms of cost i think we very clearly went on explaining why these products are better under our side and so even if we caught a little bit of a cost trade-off i think it's all okay if people are paying more for a better quality product so let's talk then about cost what are their claims on cost I think they make three. The first is they say you can be more likely to use this offline, or like be able to customize it to some degree. I think you can often do this on subscription-based models. Again, subscription-based models, look at things like Spotify, right, or Netflix. Often you can pay a higher amount to have offline access or stuff like that. Like, I don't really understand how technology works, but people have made a way to be able to do those things where you can download particular features and you can work offline and remotely. But again, this just seems like a somewhat nitpicky issue. Again, if there are more products to choose from, you're more likely to find one that is already customized to a need rather than having to do that work yourself, because there is just more diversity there to purchase from. But additionally, it's somewhat unclear to me why companies will allow you to do things like customize even take a company like apple right does not let you for example or it's very difficult to put a different operating system on your apple like laptop even though i guess you own it because they have barriers in place because they want to keep you on a particular you know i guess version of it again far easier to do when companies aren't competing to the same degree because they've locked you into an apple computer and you're not going to go buy a windows one like two months after that so that's their first claim again i think a bit marginal maybe you are able to make it a pretty color or something under their side but i think you can probably do that for that house as well the second thing they say is that also, it's likely to be more secure because it's on your own laptop. Again, I don't know much about technology, but just think about this for a second. Your laptop is connected to the internet, which means even things that are on it are able to be accessed remotely. David gives the example of how phones can be accessed. That's true, I own my phone, but the fact that it is connected at all means that even things that are on it are vulnerable to cyber attacks and stuff like that. I think the far bigger difference rather than whether you own it or whether it's online, is about whether or not the security of that technology, whether it's patched, whether it has weaknesses, that sort of thing, because that determines much more also the ease of a hacker being able to access it and whether they're going to try it in the first place. So I think we also give compelling reasons why there are cybersecurity weaknesses under their side. Again, I don't really know how laptops work, but I think you can still hack things that are uh, on the database. The final one I think best they claim they make is that the only way you incentivize people to make better products and to create better things is when they have to convince people to buy the next level at some point. But no, just again, sense check this. I think it's far better when you have to convince them to resubscribe next month so you still have an incentive to keep them in your market. You still have an incentive to provide the best you know, quality versions as opposed to when they're unlikely to fork out $800 to buy the next edition overall, like your incentive there is far smaller. But also, I think we explain that this leads to often perverse forms of innovation where actually you're doing things that are, you know, downgrading the old technology that somebody already owned. Because again, that is the only way you can get them to convert is if it's really inconvenient because it no longer connects to their printer or whatever in that sense. So overall, I think that's, that's all worse. But again, I think even if you buy all three of their mechanisms, these are it's all kind of drops in the sea compared to what we tell you about how the market just becomes far, far, far less competitive when consumers are more locked into particular areas, when they are more risk adverse because they want to buy something that is going to last them in perpetuity if they're paying infinity dollars for it, rather than able to switch between so more willing to give investment to small startups and companies. So, but also when things like pirating meet innovation is far worse because you don't want to develop new technology because it would just be stolen by someone else. This affirmative team to accrue the majority of their benefits and avoid the majority of the harms we tell you exist, they rely entirely on individuals being willing to move from one subscription to another and knowing when they should do so. And there's a couple problems with this. Firstly, in terms of being able to move between different subscriptions, we explain to you that there is a lack of capacity for the reason there is path dependency. Both because you as an individual become used to a specific service. You become used to the UI of how SOLIDWORKS exists and you understand how it works and you are unable to change. But furthermore, because of the path dependency of the market. Because the other engineering firm you must send this file to only has SOLIDWORKS, so you must also provide them a SOLIDWORKS file because otherwise they cannot fucking read it. For that reason, there is huge amounts of path dependency that forces you to use a specific kind of software. But secondly, we explain to you that there is no capacity to move to another item because if one doesn't exist, because often these are monopolistic markets. Their response to this is to say, but, but, but Canva exists. Canva makes your fucking primary school presentation. It doesn't make your fucking Photoshop file that actually looks good and you can actually post on a fucking billboard. Be so fucking for real. So that explains then why you have a lack of capacity. Final thing in terms of why individuals are unable to do this, because they simply don't know when they should, because you do not know what you, like don't know what you don't know. You are unable to, you are not aware of the things that you could move to and whether or not they will be meaningfully better. So you are unlikely to know that you should switch. You're unlikely to know if you should make that change. What does, what benefits of theirs relies on this? 
Firstly, to explain why a subscription wouldn't be hugely expensive into the long run and is unlikely to do so, they rely on competition. They rely on competition between different market players to drive down the price of a subscription. When that competition no longer exists, the price for a subscription increases drastically. Secondly, they rely on it for the innovation claim. For, because for you to believe that a company has a pressure to increase the security on their software, that the company has a pressure to increase the quality of their software, the individuals that use that product must be willing to shift to another product, to leave behind that subscription and move to a different one because it is that risk of that person moving away that means they are likely to actually make that change and make that innovation so at the point where people are unwilling to make that move they have no incentive to innovate and we explain this to you down the bench we explain to you that on our side in comparison they have to innovate because that's the only way they can make money because the only reason someone will buy the product again and give that company more money is if that company makes a meaningful innovation and makes a meaningful change now in the rest of the debate. Firstly on cost, then innovation, then user experience. Firstly in terms of cost. They claim on our side there's a high upfront cost. We explain to you quite structurally that it cannot be too high for the reason that if the bar is set too high, then no one's able to buy it and the company makes no money. For the simple reason that lots of small businesses cannot pay $100,000 in one go, Adobe has to lower their profit margins if they wish to make any profit at all. For that reason, it's likely that the high upfront cost is not likely to be as high as they claim and shut down all of the businesses in the world. But furthermore, we explain to you that the reason the shift to a subscription structurally happened is because it made these companies more money, which explains why it was a higher cost to the consumer on net over time. They say that you might temporarily want to use it to make a logo without ever explaining why you yourself had to make the logo and someone else couldn't do it. They talk about competition. I've responded to that already. Uh, I've brought up our responses to that already. We explain to you that people are structurally bad at doing the calculations about this cost when it comes to a subscription. This went largely unresponded to. They say you reconsider it month after month, but obviously there are a set of individuals who are not savvy enough to do that. Secondly, in terms of innovation, they say you must innovate to keep people paying your subscription. I responded to that in terms of the lack of, um, lack of competition. They say, and obviously as well as that, in terms of their stuff about security, as we explained to you, on a server, it's far worse. They say phones can be hacked. We explained to you, it's about the amount of access points. Every phone leads into the server, but only one point leads into your phone. That explains why it's far easier to hack a server. Furthermore, we give you the reasons as to why this is largely symmetric in the sense that you can sell someone a patch. You can sell them an add-on that will increase the security of their device. This explains why we win on innovation, increasing the user experience itself. But furthermore, directly in terms of user experience, we explain it is more convenient and unresponded to. We explain that it is customizable. They say they won't let you, but obviously that's not how that's able to work when you own something. Finally, we explain data mining is far more likely to occur with a subscription. For those reasons, we win on all the issues in this debate. Proud to the get. Awesome, thank you so much for that reply. And to conclude the debate, I'd like to welcome the affirmative reply. The problem with 90% of their case is that it's just uncomparative mitigation, right? Like, we explain that people can swap under their outside. They say, well, swapping is hard after a month. Obviously, swapping is much harder if you've bought millions, spent millions of dollars into a, a outright software that you own totally. We explain that, oh, piracy happens. They say, well, piracy can still happen because you can use these workarounds to get the same thing. We explain, obviously, it's significantly harder on our side when you have to associate with account that you continually have to log into. They, we say, well, there's planned obsolescence. They just say, well, this is illegal. But I explained at first that obviously the ways they do it isn't the straw man from Will's speech, which is like they put some bug in that auto self-destructs. Just look at my speech where they say they obviously just make it so that new versions aren't compatible with hardware. It's very easy, hard to pull that out as legal. We say that there's patching. They say, well, you can sell a patch or you can, uh, you can sell a patch that people can buy or you can customize. But yeah, obviously, maybe to some degree, but these are less marketable products. And it also relies on people actually proactively buying the patch versus our model that we explain where the patch comes in automatically. You're protected automatically. So that's like nine percent of the debate, which is we say there's a benefit and they're like, well, it's not as big as you think, but it's still pretty big.
The only two unique harms they have is on users. The first they say is the idea that the price is higher because compounding, and Brennan explains this in a really weirdly patronizing way, like we don't understand that the price is higher over the time. We behave okay, free responses. First, Jordan explains that it's not actually a harm if the price is higher, because what people are doing is that they're consenting to that cost benefit analysis every single month. Every single month they're reevaluating that and think that is useful for them, and we think that it's fine. Like, obviously there are some people who think that is not useful and they can opt out, right? Under their side, people can't opt out because they buy a product and like the company assumes they're going to be using that over their lifetime, but they actually impulse buy it and they only need it for a month, but then they just spent all that money. Secondly, we explain that the cost of being higher over time is entirely fair using their example of borrowing money from a bank, because obviously if you borrow money over a longer time, you have to pay mortgage installments. And we explain at Jordan that that's fine because people use that to generate productivity, right? Yes, the cost might be higher, but you also have more money because you're able to start that business with that software in the first place. And lastly, we explain that it's, this cost is important to the market the key ecosystem, things like competition and innovation, a benefit they clearly don't care about when they keep saying piracy is a good thing. The second harm they say is about bias. They say people are short-termists, it's harder to conceptualize costs. We explain also there's a soft set of biases that apply to their side. We explain at my speech that people are risk-averse from trying something. Gypsy explains that people impulse buy something really big when they have the money to do so. So clearly consumers on both sides make poor choices. The difference is, however, that if a consumer consumer makes a poor choice on our side, you have the ability to opt out because you've paid a lower cost and you're on a subscription model. There's no ability to opt out of a bad choice under their side. That is why our case of biases completely outweigh their case of biases. And no, Brendan's like Hail Mary at third about, oh, you could just use a loan, doesn't counter this. Because if you loan something and then you decide you don't want that laptop anymore, you still have to pay back the principal. You can't just be like, oh, I only pay for a third of it and then give up on using it. Lastly, they talk about external versus internal data. Gypsy explains that even if you own the software, you're always going to have connections to the internet. Whether you connect your laptop to the internet or whether you have like Microsoft Outlook and you receive emails from the internet. So all their harms are external and internal access points are symmetric. What's not symmetric is under our side, the company has an incentive to protect you through data patches. Under their sides, they leave consumers to fend for themselves through the customizations that no normal consumer does. Lastly, in terms of the market, uh, they say companies do stuff for profit and keep dog whistling this as a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with profit. Companies need profit to maintain competition and innovation. The test is whether that is that competition. We prove structurally that you're able to switch and Jordan proves that empirically by giving literally 20 examples that they respond to like one of them with Disney Plus and their only response is like, well, there's already a monopoly. Like this argument only works if you think there's literally only one company. There's obviously loads of companies and is comparatively far more competitive under our side. Companies have the incentive to solve those issues in the first place because they need to compete with other companies. They need to do things like patches for these reasons I'm very proud to propose. Awesome. Thank you so much everyone for an excellent day. Oh, good. It's a rare debate these days where I get to claim to be more in touch with modern things like technology than an opposition team, but thank God I've finally gotten the chance after five long years. So let's talk firstly about the way that the market has changed over the past and why it is the fact that subscription-based models have broken several important monopolies in the software market directly and clearly led to higher quality competition. And then I'm going to go through why that is so much better for consumers, why it is better for the economy, not just in terms of the software economy, but for the economy as a whole, noting that almost every time type of business these days relies on high quality software to operate in the economy. So let's talk about the monopolies that have been broken. Photoshop is the first one that they identify and they claim that it's monopolistic. This is just untrue. There are several different competitors to Photoshop and they are starting to rise because they have been able to take advantage of the subscription model. The first one of GIMP, which is just an outright free software. The second one is things like Canva, which you can access for free on a basic model, but also you can pay a premium version of that. And that is something people are willing to do and try replacing Photoshop with because because it is a low cost for them to do so and to see what it works like and because they can access the free version and say oh this is actually good and I'm willing to take a chance on the more expensive one and they can see directly the types of products they're able to access when they get the higher quality version you also have things like much higher quality Photoshop uh, photo, sorry, photo editing software is integrated into phone based cameras and for some types of creators that is sufficient and it's allowed them to replace Photoshop entirely and many of those also come with subscriptions that you can use to access it to improve it for instance if you have a Google phone you you can buy Google Photos Plus, which allows you to improve the quality of photos that you are just taking. For some types of content creators who are doing more photo-based work, 
who had to rely on Photoshop in the past, now they can rely on their phone software and that's often more integrated, easier for them to use. The second one they talk about is iTunes and they say iTunes was so good because it was giving lots of artists money to artists and now artists are getting less money, which just concedes that the prices consumers are paying used to be very, very high and now they are much lower. So maybe it's a little bit sad for artists, but it is clearly much better for consumers generally. And obviously it's not just artists who are making lots of money off of iTunes. Apple was making crap tons of money off of iTunes, which is why things like Apple uh, iPods used to be much cheaper and now you have to pay quite a bit of money for a phone because the iTunes money was subsidizing the iPod, which was locked onto iTunes and could not access any other sort of music. Now you can download things like Spotify onto your iPhone. You're no longer locked into that type of monopoly. You can also access things like SoundCloud, SoundCloud which is optimized for smaller artists, remixes, stuff like that. You pay less for it. You can choose to access YouTube Music, which is integrated with YouTube and sometimes a better product for people who use YouTube a lot. You can access Amazon Music, which is great because it's bundled with things like Amazon Video and Amazon Prime Premium. And you can access more expensive flak based ser streaming services, which give you lossless music. Those are more expensive but offer a higher quality audio experience for people who really care about that. So all of that is just to prove that in the past we had a monopoly, iTunes. Now we have a highly competitive market for music. And that has directly led to more differentiated services that are good for some types of consumers. So that is a competitive market that is clearly better. The last one is Netflix. This is also just a clear victory for us, right? Once upon a time, you had to pay Netflix a fair bit of money. Originally, it was cheap because Netflix was using a loss leading strategy that would have never been sustainable anyway. Now you get to choose between many different streaming services, some of which are optimized towards British TV, like the hilariously named BritBox, or you can access things like Amazon Prime, which do a lot of originals and offer kind of more gritty stuff generally, I suppose. So all of this just proves that the mechanisms we give you around making things easier for consumers to try out new things in a way that is low risk, to switch between those things if they want to, are clearly true and have clearly led to a breakup of monopolies. The last gasp that they have against this is to go, oh, the tech sector is really, really profitable. Something which we agree on, that is necessary to have a competitive market. In a world where the market is operating on incredibly thin margins, that explains why only the biggest are able to survive and why competitors can never access VC funding or credit to start up because those VCs know it is a low margin market where they would never, where they would never recover their costs. So a market that is more characterized by things like piracy, by things like guys downloading a software and sharing it amongst all their colleagues, is a world where nobody else is able to compete against software firms like Microsoft. On our world there is profit, but it is distributed across many different insurgents and competitors. On their world there is a similar, probably much larger amount of profit for tech companies, because it is a more monopolistic market, and that is obviously concentrated amongst only the strongest. Ask yourself at the end of this then, what type of market do you prefer? Do you, as a consumer, prefer to be able to try out new services to see if they are right for you and to switch between them relatively easily? You have not sunk in a cost. You are asking yourself every month or every week if you want to continue to pay for your subscription. If you are somebody who, you know, actually cares about the value of money, maybe because they don't have lots of it, you probably maintain track of your subscriptions and when it comes out of your account, you feel that pain. You ask yourself if it is worthwhile. I guess this team has so much cash that they never really worry about it and they get owned by things like Super <laughs> Premium. That is not true for things like small businesses. It is not true for the vast majority of consumers. So I guess that's just kind of, again, a bit out of touch. The last thing to note here is just that this change has been driven by consumers because a lot of that old purchased outright software still exists and it is less profitable, less profitable because consumers are not opting into it. This team just relies on the intuition that big tech is so powerful that they control everything and while we just bow to their whims. Ask yourself then why it is that newer versions of Photoshop, which are subscription based, are better than the old versions. Why is it the case that new insurgent music streaming services are better than iTunes was? So this just does not make any sense. That means that all of our mechanisms about why it is easier to switch and why that leads to better competition apply. This also applies to things like hardware services. Will is like, oh, it would suck to rent a laptop. I have my phone on a plan. That's awesome because I would not have been able to afford to upgrade my old shit phone if I needed to drop $1,500 on a new one, but I can afford to pay 40 bucks a month for the next 36, 36 months. And that is not predatory. It's awesome because that is a fixed cost. It is locked into a contract and and in real terms, that is actually a decreasing cost because for me, my wage is likely to increase consumer, you know, the 
inflation is likely to go up, but the dollar amount that I'm paying stays the same over three years. So it's actually a decreasing cost over the long term. And this is the case for most types of subscriptions because businesses require certainty, because tech companies cannot just dictate to us in the context of a competitive market anymore. They can always fail to a new insurgent who offers you a service that is better for your business. Why is this absolutely critical for competition benefits? And why is that the by far biggest benefit in this debate? The first thing to explain here is that this allow small business to exist. Bennett is like, of course you can afford $500 if you're a small business owner. No, you can't. A lot of small businesses are things like single moms or stay at home moms doing, you know, little crafts and selling them over Etsy. A lot of small businesses are people doing things like selling little baked goods and do, you know, doing that out of their home or operating a little hair salon and doing that out of their home. And they hope to grow and they hope someday that they can buy a shop front. This is how many small businesses exist. And what is important here is that even at that level, you need to be able to do things like manage your taxes. You need to be able to do things like pay your staff. You need to be able to do things like keep track of your customers so you can send them out emails when they book an appointment with you. All of this requires different distinct little bits and pieces of software. And that means that in their world where all of this, you have to buy all of those pieces of software at once just to open your door out of a home-based business, your barrier to entry is huge. In their world, you're probably paying five grand to start a small business. And if you're somebody who cannot access credit easily, or if you're somebody who is you know, not able to have that money on hand, you just never get the chance. So this is something that is critical for new software companies who are able to start up on our side, who find it easier to attract new consumers, who can do things like make an incremental improvement instead of needing to make a fundamental game-changing improvement against something like software and still get customers. It is critical for ordinary small businesses who can access this easily, can benefit from month-long free trials. All of that means in our side of the market is far better, far fairer for consumers. Great, thank you so much for that speech. Now I'd like to welcome the third negative speaker.